It is truly wonderful to be here and to see so many lovely young women. You are the future of the church. I want to share a couple of things first. Um, my husband and I are opposites. We share the same values, but in terms of temperament, approach to things, we are completely opposites. It took us only about 25 years to sort of get the hang of, of uh, working smoothly together. But we've learned to capitalize on each other's strengths. And one of the ways in which we are different is in giving talks. So my husband has a background in speech and debate. And he had the gift of being able to get up in front of an audience and pull out a little business card on which he had written three words and give this wonderful talk. I, partly because I have a background as a lawyer, and we like to footnote everything, and <laughs> you know, we analyze, and hey, he's a lawyer too, but he approaches things differently. So I would have reams of paper and, and go through this ever um, progressive process of trying to condense. And there was one particular talk that I was giving about 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, and I was really stressed out about it. And it was a topic I knew well, but that was sort of the problem. I knew too much. And my husband said, just stop. You're overcomplicating this. You know enough to give this talk now. What's your main point? And so I shared with him my main point. And he said, all right, all you need is a beginning, middle, and an end. And you can give this talk. Well, it proved to be providential that we had that conversation because I showed up at that talk and had forgotten my notes <laughs> and had to give the talk just the way we had discussed. Why do I share that? Because my particular topic here is how to shape conversations in the culture and in the church. That's huge. Does anyone feel like that's an overwhelming thing? You know, it, it's a huge task in front of us. And in fact, the group that I lead, the Catholic Women's Forum, one of our, the quotes that, that is sort of our, our inspiration comes from Pope John Paul II um, in Christe Fidelis Laice, where he says, one of the tasks that falls to women in particular is to shape the moral dimension of culture. Again, that's a huge task. It can be overwhelming. But the problem is, I think, th that we overcomplicate it. And so the solution is to uncomplicate it. So first, let's look at that particular task in this way. The most important thing to realize is approach it with humility. God's not asking you to shape every conversation or even the most important conversations. He's asking you to shape the conversations that are in front of you in the places where he put you at the right time. And he will give you the words and the guidance. But it's important to approach the task with humility and realize we don't have to have the grand plan. And, and some of us, you know, if you're naturally a leader type, which I think all of you in this room are, you can see things out there that perhaps people in my generation could be doing far better. And we welcome those ideas. But be patient and be humble realize you don't have to do everything at once, and indeed, you shouldn't. So how do you approach this? How do you prepare yourself to be able to shape the important conversations in the culture and in the church? I think, as my husband said, there's a beginning, middle, and an end. And where we begin is with the truth and understanding the gospel. How do we share the gospel if we don't know it? How do we be evangelists? if we're not in love with our Lord Jesus Christ, if we are not walking with him in our daily life, so that it is something that comes from us, that when we approach and look at the world and, and the culture and the difficulties, there's something in us that already knows what it is that God wants out of this situation. That's not a place to begin that we get to on our own. Again, it takes being humble before God but having that determination to continue to form yourself spiritually before God ever asks you to do any particular thing. That's one of the most important things. So know the truth. Know God. Know the truth. Know what the church teaches. But then what? Where do you go? Well, realize that your life will have phases. And you don't know at this point 
how God is going to use you and in what way. My youngest son graduated from high school recently, and the graduation speaker was an admiral who had commanded some, one, of the big fleets, um, one of the big fleets out on the big ocean. I don't know which one. <laughs> <laughs> but he was talking about, and he was a Christian, and he was talking about how he had been able to respond to the responsibilities in his life. And he used a phrase that I think applies to all of us. He said, um, hold on to your plans lightly and hold on to God's hand tightly. Because especially at this point in your life where you, you see possibilities and you need to have a plan, right? You have to have some purpose to your education and some sense of what your talents are and some direction about where you're going to go. But his point's a good one, that most of us end up not doing exactly what we think we should be doing or we thought we would be doing when we were, say, 20 or 25. In fact, my experience with women is that most of us have a path that's kind of like this. I often have women ask, young women ask me, well, how did you get to where you're doing, I, I, where you are? I'd love to be doing what you're doing. And it, it was a circular roundabout path, not something I envisioned at your age, but it's a matter of being responsive to what God's asking of you in the particular moment and being patient and realizing life has phases. It means also forming yourself continually. There's no such thing as being done with your education. And I've had two conversations this week with women in significant positions, one uh, working in the international law, the other um, working in diplomacy. And both of them are doing jobs where they're doing really important things in terms of shaping the culture, in terms of improving people's lives. And yet for each of them, their path was not linear. And again, that's a good thing about us women. We don't have to follow a linear path. Our lives are not meant to look like men's lives. But one of these women had worked in the Bush administration. Then she got married and she had kids and she was a stay-at-home mom for a number of years. And during those years, she started reading theology, reading about the social issues, just educating herself in ways that that she had no idea how God would use that. And sure enough, in this administration, she is drawing upon that formation and using it in a very significant way to affect policy, to affect people's lives. But those years when she was at home, they were not dormant years. They were not years that were sort of wasted or a wasted education. They were part of God's plan and part of God's path for her. The other woman, thought she was going to have a career in academia. And she was a lawyer, but she had a, just an interest in, in uh, world religions and spent many years studying. And then by God's leading, she ended up in a place where it was like he pulled the thread and pulled it all together. And all of a sudden, she realized she had an expertise that she didn't know she was cultivating. But in each case, it was because these women were women of prayer. And they were responding to what God was asking of them at the moment. The woman who was at home was where she needed to be. The woman who was, had a bent towards academia and was pursuing that for a time was where she needed to be at the time. Those are not mistakes. That's part of God's plan. So in shaping these cultural conversations, form yourself and be attentive to God's directions. What else do you need to know? Well, if we're going to be shaping conversations, we need to understand who our audience is. What are the conversations that need to happen? And there's a, I, I found a quote from a, a woman who was leading a, a women's writing workshop about 20 years ago, and she was talking about stories and the power of, of writers to pull a theme out that helps people see something about themselves and to make a moral judgment. And she said, for many people, real lives, even lives that look fine and wonderful from the outside, are never tightly focused and elegantly coherent. Real lives are always awash in chaos, ambiguity, and uncertainty. Real lives are hip deep in suffering, pain, and fear. We need stories to forge some moral order amidst the chaos of our lives. We have the story 
that brings order to the chaos of people's lives. That's what the gospel is. That's what the truth is. But we need to tune in and to hear what those needs are, to be attentive to the concerns of the people out there who are expressing all these things that seem so disconnected. It's by listening and hearing and, and looking for that theme that we can pull it together and realize what they need to hear. So just as I was sort of paralyzed by knowing too much when I was trying to craft that talk years ago, we can think, well, I know this huge body of truth. What do I say to someone who's hurting because she had an abortion? What do I say to the family that doesn't want their elderly grandmother to suffer, and so they're, they're debating euthanasia in a very practical sense? You figure out what to say by tuning in to what those needs are, what the hurts are, by knowing your audience. And then you will draw upon the right truth. What else do we need to know? Uh, we need to know what questions to ask. Because part of shaping the cultural conversation is figuring out what isn't being said. Amy Wellborn wrote a terrific article. Some of you may not know who she is. She's a longtime Catholic writer. She's an author of many books. She wrote an article in Catholic World Report a couple of years ago called Women in the Protestant Reformation. Great article to read. But in the process, she said, we need to learn to question narratives. She said, who is telling the story? What's their interest in shaping the narrative? What are they including? And what are they leaving out? And it's by asking those questions that we will get a sense of how to shape the conversation. And here's a very practical example. When it, the number of states that have passed restrictions on abortion or bans on abortion, for example, in Alabama, have generated just this frenzy of, um, from the left saying women's lives are gonna be ruined. And so we saw this past week 180 CEOs come out with a, a declaration saying that they, they were against these bans, they didn't want to do business in the state of Alabama because it was gonna hurt women. That's sort of the typical narrative, right? If you're against abortion, you're hurting women. Well, some people who were listening to that and asked the questions, what's not being said, have been able to push back in the past couple of days with a different narrative that says, what are these CEOs saying? They don't want moms working for them. They think it's a problem for women to have children and to succeed. You know? So shifting that narrative has an impact because all of a sudden, people who are swimming in this knowledge and, or swimming in this confusion of facts see things from a different perspective. So it's in asking that question, what's unsaid? In a similar way, those of you who've been following the abuse crisis within the church might remember the um, woman journalist, I believe she was from Mexico, who spoke to the, the Vatican gathering this past February. And she got their attention because she sounded themes that they had not been talking about. And she spoke from her heart as a mama bear, saying, we want our children protected. And she said it in a way that had not been said before. But she spoke also as a journalist. And she said, as a journalist, we're going to expose the evil that we find. And so by reframing the conversation from her perspective, she had an impact, and one that I hear continually drawn upon by priests and bishops as they reflect on, on what their course of action should be. So ask the right questions. And then finally, practically, how do we, how do we begin to do this? Well, first and always pray. Cultivate a deep prayer life so that you're nimble and responsive to the Holy Spirit, so that you can hear him. You can't just tune in once in a while. You have to be in a relationship. So when God says turn left, you turn left, even though the GPS is saying turn right. So pray. What else? Learn to collaborate with other women, not to compete. And I think our culture is so competitive that we oftentimes look at someone else's success as something that's a problem or something that, that perhaps creates an obstacle for us. So back to that original point, that if we're to shape the conversations, we don't have to shape every conversation. We don't have to shape even the most important conversations. And indeed, we can't. We need to shape the conversations that the Lord wants us to shape. And we need to help other women 
to raise their voices and to do the same. And that power of collaboration, that power of bringing together women from their own perspectives to speak up and to, to reach others is tremendous. We're force multipliers, as they say, in the business world. So collaborating, not competing. And then finally, being detached. Remembering that whatever good we do, it's not about us. It's about being his instrument. That whether you found something or you write something or you set something in motion, be prepared to walk away. Because it's not about you. God uses your talents, but if he, if he paralyzes you tomorrow, he's going to use your suffering and your prayer and, your, and all that you offer in yourself in a different way. And that's all it's about. It's about being the instrument in God's hand and being willing to be responsive. So hold your own plans lightly and hold God's plan tightly. Thank you.